I've told other cave diving horror stories, but this one is by far the scariest. The explorer in this tale gave his all to mapping undiscovered and legendary caves. Even the genuine possibility of death did not stop him from exploring. The Planora 10 cave is situated in Galway, Ireland. Since no one knew the cave's depth, or whether the area was free of sinkholes, it was strictly forbidden for anyone to approach it. The locals were constantly afraid that the ground would give way beneath them if someone wandered too close to the cave. The cave gained a mythical kind of reputation due to the danger that lurked just inside it. The Planora Caves are the remains of a much older underground system in the area that consists of many collapses, caves with water-filled parts, and caverns. Cave divers' diving exploration has revealed parts of this extensive underground network. Arthur Kozlowski heard about the Planora Caves and became very interested in being the first to map them out completely. Unfortunately, this would be a perilous endeavor due to the numerous risks. While diving, you might become disoriented if your dive line breaks or if you didn't even have one set up. A cave filled with water is littered with pockets of poisonous gas. Because of gas narcosis and toxicity, freaking out at depth underwater makes panicking much easier. A freaked out diver could grab your gear and rip off your dive mask. Divers who panic may also kick up sediment which prevents them from knowing which way is up, down, or any other direction because if they're using a rebreather, there's no air bubbles that would show them the way up. You might not even be able to see anything at all if your lights stop working or it runs out of battery. And you might become trapped because there is no way out due to the collapse of rock formations. These places are not safe and keep in mind that you cannot simply swim to the surface if something goes wrong you must return through the maze which got you deep into the cave in the first place. One thing to remember, you are always running out of air. Despite all of these dangers, the Planora 10 cave captured Arthur Kozlowski's attention the most. He went there and attempted to explore the cave during his first visit. He asked the locals if they knew anything about the cave and if they were willing to share any information with him. Locals warned Arthur about the dangers, but they kind of also wanted him to explore it and they were happy to help him with whatever he needed for the exploration. Over time, Arthur became a regular visitor to the area. He became obsessed with the cave and was amazed at how extensive the cave was. He even brought his friends, Jim, Frank, and Dave Walter, all experienced cave divers from England, Belgium, and Poland. This cave was unlike anything they had ever seen before. The more they explored it and learned about it, the more intrigued they all became. Arthur made a map of part of Planora 10, and each dive attempt he took after that changed it. He and his friends worked their way 810 meters into the cave, which they called the Known Limits. Experts agree that the cave goes further than this, it is known that the cave is about 52 meters below ground level where it was filled with water and would require diving gear to get to. Galway County Council hired Arthur as a consultant to assess whether the area's massive caves should support the weight of a road on top of them. All of the money Arthur made from his consulting work and from his articles he submitted to newspapers went towards him upgrading his diving gear, which would allow him to make it to the bottom of the Planora Caves. Even though he had almost no money, because his consulting work didn't really pay that well, he would spend all of his last pennies on diving equipment. Arthur became really friendly with a local family and began staying in their house during the exploration, and in the summer, he would sleep in a tent on their farm. He would sometimes turn up unannounced and show up for dinner, and then depart just as suddenly. He was friendly with all the neighbors, and he was described as the type of person that everybody wanted to be friends with. Originally from Poland, Arthur moved to Ireland to study giant unexplored cave systems in 2006. His Irish friends called him Arthur Conrad. He initially had no interest in cave diving, but one day a friend took him into a cave filled with water, and that changed everything. He was enthralled by the wonder and adventure of exploring a location that only a select few had ever experienced. When he moved to Ireland, he had 13 logged dives, all of them in the warm waters of the Arab Gulf. 
In 2007, he started learning cave diving with legendary Welsh cave diving instructor Martin Farr. His mentor Martin is a leading exploratory cave diver and caver known for his record-breaking cave dives and the exploration of many miles of previously undiscovered underground passages. He was Arthur's biggest inspiration. As a writer and photographer, he has written many books about cave diving's history, techniques, and places to go. Just one year after working closely with Martin, Arthur built the confidence to push the known limits of the Palumetary Resurgence, recording the deepest underwater cave dive in Ireland and Britain at 103 meters deep or 300 feet. Since that time, his main interest shifted to largely unexplored, massive underwater cave systems underlying the Gort Lowlands in Ireland. He started using a rebreather, which took more expertise, but had some advantages. The main ones being that rebreather diving would extend gas endurance. It was very quiet and there was no bubbles. Beyond the near silent bliss, rebreathers offered further benefits, including increased time to stay at depth, decreased decomplications, and it was just easier to manage. As a result, Arthur was able to make more aggressive dives and not worry about the issues of using traditional air. One of his most notable accomplishments was discovering a 4 kilometer or 2.5 mile new underwater passage in Ireland with Jim Warney. Jim was one of Arthur's closest friends, and aside from his family, this was the person who knew him best. Together they continued traditional style cave diving explorations, mainly in the northern caves of Ireland while dry caving, and moved on to the more risky water-filled cave exploration, which would require diving. Friends of Arthur said he quickly became involved in all aspects of cave diving soon after this, and started his own training company. He had many of the certifications needed to be a professional diver. He was based in Dublin, but traveled the entire nation to teach diving classes. Arthur spent most of his time making maps of parts of cave systems in Ireland and Spain that had not been mapped before. Most of all, what he wanted to do was find connections in caves and make the missing link between ancient passageways. This was extremely dangerous and why it hadn't been done before. On top of that, most people thought connections between caves were a myth. In 2009 and 10, he found connections in multiple cave systems. He also discovered one of the longest cave systems ever in Northern Ireland. Describing the longest traverse, which he undertook with Jim Warney, Arthur said it could be often challenging to find subterranean routes with visibility with less than a half a meter or about two feet. However, he found diving during rainy periods useful so he could use the underground rivers to guide himself. Due to how hard it was to save people, cave divers had to be totally self-sufficient. Perhaps his most notable achievement was the exploration of 10 kilometers or 6.2 miles of underwater passage in the notoriously unforgiving cave passages of the Gort region, including the discovery and exploration of the cave Polandre. Arthur was continuously setting new records for cave diving, and in March 2011, he received the Kowalski Award for Cave Exploration at the annual Polish Traveling and Outdoor Sports Conference held in Gdynia, Ireland. On one particularly heart-wrenching dive, Arthur was inside the cave and could hear loud rumbling all around him. He checked on his gear to see if something was wrong and couldn't figure out where the noise was coming from. He was terrified because he thought that the cave might collapse or that there were small earthquakes going on inside it. He could get trapped in the cave and have no way out if it did collapse. But he kept listening and eventually he found out that it was noise from the traffic on the road above the cave. Arthur made great progress in mapping out the Planora cave system, and eventually he only had three caves left in the system to finish mapping. He wanted to make the connection between Poldalin and Poltafil and tackle the most dangerous cave, Planora 10. This mission would be the most challenging and scary. If successful, he would prove there was a connection between Poldalin and Poltafil. It seemed to him that trying to forge the connection from Poltafil should be easier, as in 2009, he got pretty far into the cave and left his dive line at an open passage, about 1,070 meters or about just over a mile from the entrance. He went inside Poltafil and began to descend the cave. Additional ropes were set up at the surface in case he needed to haul himself back out. 
At the surface, there was a powerful flow. The underwater suction didn't seem particularly powerful at first, but he knew appearances might be deceiving because he could feel its full force on his back. He moved carefully down to about 21 meters and paused there, unsure of what to do next. This cave was unlike anything he'd ever tackled before and he was in the furthest he had ever been. He was still in control, even though the hardest part of the dive with the heaviest flow was behind him. He knew that if he went ahead and his rebreather failed, nothing would be able to save him. If he went further, there was almost no chance of him getting back even if the smallest thing went wrong. He had to accept this fate and continue on. He kept going at that depth until the channel started to descend. He was able to get to a depth of 60 meters or 180 feet. At that point, his diving line broke and he started to freak out. He kept descending and expected to see a large reel which he had tied his line to the year before. Instead, the line's end was slack. It was loose and just hanging there and somehow tied behind a small boulder. He tried to calm himself down. This was an extremely scary situation. Things were not going as planned. He attached a fresh reel and began to follow his line to get out of the cave. The passage was extremely narrow and sharp. Then, the passage rose before beginning to drop across a level, clean floor. However, he figured he was still moving in the right direction, and he had to have faith that he was on the right track. After two and a half years and 45 dives on both sides, he was shocked to discover that he had made the connection with Paul Delin. Adrenaline began to shoot through his entire body and he continued along the line for a short distance before coming across a marking. It was the section of line from his previous Paul Delin dive. To his surprise, however, the moment he made the connection was very different from what he had anticipated. He didn't experience any genuine elation, deep joy, or contentment. Instead, he experienced sadness, perhaps because it was over. According to him, there were only two types of tragedies, not getting what you want and obtaining it. He eventually made his way out of the cave after a very challenging and exhausting exit. After dives with multiple close calls, the link between Paul to Phil and Paul Deline was finally found. Finding that connection meant so much to Arthur, but he still had one more thing to do, and that was to map out Polinora 10 fully. He had to put in a lot of preparation time and dives to do this. He attempted to do it over the weekend. On Saturday and Sunday, Arthur went diving as normal, and on Monday, he went diving as he just had before, but this time he deposited his stage oxygen bottles because he would need them for the decompression and in case of an emergency. He ran into a couple problems on his previous dives in this cave, and it scared him really bad, so he made arrangements with two of his friends to raise the alarm and call rescue if he had not returned by 9pm on Monday night. The cave was in a very rural location, which made things a bit more complicated. He entered the Planora 10 cave and had about six hours that he would be able to stay in the cave before he needed to come out due to lack of air. He knew that he'd have to push himself to the limit in order to map this cave fully. So he worked his way down the horizontal channels and moved swiftly through confined sections. This was his dream and all of his hard work was finally starting to pay off. The finish was in sight. However, when Arthur wasn't back by 5 p.m., his friends got concerned, and they were not rescue divers, so they contacted more experienced friends. Very quickly, they decided to call professional rescue divers. There were several air pockets in the cave, and Arthur was a very experienced diver, so there was a chance he was still alive. If rescue divers could get down the cave in a reasonable amount of time, they could save Arthur. So the pressure was on and the rescue team showed up to initiate a plan to get Arthur out. News spread very quickly that he was missing and by the following afternoon, the local town was a hive of media activity. As everyone waited anxiously for the news about Arthur, a lot of TV and radio stations came to the area. Specialist search and rescue teams from Ireland, Wales, and England were involved in the rescue attempt. Unfortunately, the hope of finding him alive was very short-lived as experts in the field explained it would be impossible to survive in such conditions. 
there were conflicting reports every hour that Arthur had gone too far into the cave and would never be found, or that even if his body was discovered, they might not be able to bring it back to the surface. They hoped Arthur would wait it out until supplementary oxygen could be brought to him. Then he would know exactly what to do to get out. He's had several close calls before, and this is something that he lived for. They knew that he would do everything to get out alive. The initial search was coordinated by Arthur's friend, Jim Warney. Jim was devastated that Arthur was stuck in the cave. Jim is regarded as one of the area's most skilled and well-known divers. If anyone would be able to get Arthur out, it would be Jim. The father of one is said to have risked his life and dropped everything in the hope of getting Arthur safely back to his family. He is also a member of the Irish Cave Rescue Organization. On Monday night, he spent the whole time looking for possible air pockets within the cave where he thought Arthur might have been hiding. He made dive after dive inspecting various areas of the cave. Jim was cautioned against using such risky rescue techniques because this mission was extremely dangerous, but he wanted to risk everything to find Arthur. Finally, when there seemed to be little or no chance left, Jim discovered a dive line that Arthur had set up that ran the entire length of the cave. British cave divers Rick Stanton and John Volanthan had been asked to assist in the search for Arthur. They are among the best in Europe and have been requested to perform a rescue dive because of their extensive experience and training in technical diving environments. The divers were due to arrive in Ireland on Wednesday evening. It had been over 48 hours since the initial alarm was raised that Arthur was trapped in the cave. Rick and John joined Jim inside the cave. They went down 350 meters or about 1,200 feet, but their efforts turned up nothing. Meanwhile, Jim examined an unsearched part of the 800 meter wide cave, which was about 52 meters deep. Connor McGrath of the Irish Cave Rescue Organization said there was a large airspace that had been found about halfway into the cave and that they would explore that area. There was also an airspace near the surface, so that gave them hope that Arthur might have been inside of it. People frequently remarked to the locals that given how dangerous the cave was and how likely it was for someone to get trapped inside, they must have regretted letting Arthur dive into it. The fact that such a skilled diver and explorer had the guts to take on such a difficult mission as mapping out the cave, however, was more of an honor in the eyes of the locals. Sadly, Jim Warney found Arthur's body in an underwater passage at around 6 p.m. Wednesday. It took Jim an hour to dive into the narrow passage where Arthur's body lay with his oxygen tanks and guide rope fully attached. He was discovered just over a mile from the cave's entrance. Arthur's situation was sad because he couldn't find an air pocket with enough oxygen to survive. Being able to bring his body back to the surface and the fact that Jim had discovered it were both consoling. Arthur was given the highest respect when his body was brought above ground. A doctor was there to confirm that Arthur was deceased. He was taken to University College Hospital Galway for a post-mortem examination, which revealed that he had drowned. By this time, word of Arthur's story had spread throughout the nation, and when it was confirmed that he had passed away, the entire nation wept in unison. Everyone was very saddened to learn that they would never see him again. His friends were devastated by his passing, and as a gesture of respect, they made a film about his life called Riders of the Storm that included a lot of footage from his own camera. Riders of the Storm was screened by the Sub-Aqua Societies of Trinity College Dublin and University College Galway. It won a prestigious award at a Polish film festival. Thanks for watching the video, and remember to subscribe if you like the content. I hope to see you at the next one.